Well, hello everyone at home. Welcome to the final Wednesday evening of the 2021-22 uh, observing season. Um, we're going out with a bang. We've got a wonderful talk about the James Webb Space Telescope uh, for you uh, with astronomer Dr. James Trussler from the University of Manchester. Um, we've also got a bit of a treat coming up after the talk, um, so we're not going to have time to, for questions, but in return we're going to make up for it by observing the International Space Station, which is passing over Cambridge at around 8.45. Um, so we'll go straight from the talk to our observers from the Cambridge Astronomical Association uh, to look at the ISS and more under the beautifully clear skies that we have right now. Um, so I think uh, that's going to be uh, that's it for the introduction. I'm going to pass over to our headline speaker, Dr. James Trussler. He's going to be telling us all about James Webb's cosmic treasure hunt. Um, so over to you, James. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for that uh, lovely introduction and good evening, everyone. As Matt said, I'm James Trussler from the University of Manchester. I hope that you're all ready because tonight we're going to embark on a grand cosmic voyage, sailing the great sea of space in search of the greatest treasure in all the cosmos, the very first jewels to shine in the night sky. So all aboard and ready the sails because our journey starts now. So it is rare in our history that our view of the world and our place inside it fundamentally changes forever. And one such crucial moment was several hundred years ago when ships sailed west in search of a new way to form trade routes with the Far East by circumnavigating the globe. But this ambitious plan initially failed, not because the journey was perilous and difficult, although it certainly was, but because the world was not quite the way we always thought it was. In fact, it was much larger than we ever could have imagined. You see, as these ships sailed west, they found that the Americas were there. They were discovered the two new continents. And so our view of the world changed forever on that day. The age of discovery was upon us. And growing up, I felt a sense of envy, a sense of longing, wishing that I had been around in those days, perhaps sailing on one of those great ships, exploring the beauties of the earth or being back home and hearing of these wonderful tales of exotic far off lands. But now being older and wiser, I see things differently. I no longer feel this envy because I've come to realize that a new great adventure awaits us. You see, we find ourselves at one of these key pivotal moments once again, where our view of the world and our place inside it is going to change forever once more. A golden age, a discovery is soon upon us and perhaps it will be the greatest one of all. For a great ship has set sail. But this is not one of the ships of old sailing our earthly seas. No, this is a ship sailing the grandest sea of all, the great sea of space. And we will not be discovering our world this time. No, we will be discovering the very first worlds to form in our universe, the very first galaxies at the very beginning of time, at the dawn of creation. But we always will be looking at completely other worlds, planets orbiting around other stars. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, and it will usher in a grand new age of discovery, forever changing our view of the cosmos and our place inside it. So that's what I'd like to talk about today, how we can use the James Webb Space Telescope to find the greatest treasure. And no, this is not the treasure of old, a treasure chest filled with gold and silver coins, but this is the greatest treasure in all the cosmos, the very first jewels to shine in the night sky, the very first stars in our universe shining shortly after the Big Bang. And so our voyage begins now on Christmas day, 2021, the James Webb Space Telescope launching into space, leaving our earthly harbor. And here we see our first and final close-up view of the James Webb Space Telescope, where it belongs in space, spreading its wings, breaking free from the rocket that boosted it into the skies. And 
If I skip ahead, we will see something quite spectacular. You see the sun's rays are shining onto the telescope and we see the telescope begin to deploy, begin to unfold. See, the James Webb is such an ambitious mission. The telescope is so large that it can't even fit properly inside the rocket. It had to be folded up for it to fit inside. And we see here the beginning of that unfolding process, the solar array beginning to deploy and the sun's light shining on the telescope. And I remember that Christmas day watching this footage and thinking, yes, the James Webb will be the key. It will be the key to open the cosmic treasure chest and reveal the hidden mysteries of our universe. So here we see more of that unfolding process, unfolding the $10 billion space origami, the James Webb Space Telescope. So we begin with the solar array being deployed. That's what we had seen just before, but there's many more pieces of the puzzle that have to fit together for the telescope to function the way that it should. So that's what we're seeing here, the number of days that have elapsed since the launch day, 25 December, Christmas Day, 2021. So here we begin to see the separation between the telescope itself with its golden mirrors and the grand sun shield, the essentially parasol that will be shielding the telescope from the rays of sunlight from the sun, keeping the telescope cool, enabling it to pick up the light from the faintest glimmers, the faintest objects at the very edge of the universe. These are the first stars that we seek. And so we continue to see the solar array, uh, the, the, the sun shield being deployed, being stretched out into its proper position. And now the separate layers separating out. This gives the telescope the proper thermal insulation, allow it to cool to very, very low temperatures. Now the mirror starts to fall into place, the secondary mirror being put into position. What we'll be seeing shortly now is the parts of the telescope itself, the mirror segment swinging into place. This is the primary mirror assembling its true form. So now that the deployments have completed, the telescope is heading off to where it was always meant to be, its final destination. And so this is Webb's final destination where it has set anchor and will stay forevermore. It's beyond the moon, four times the distance to the moon is where the Webb Space Telescope is now placed. And this is called Lagrange point two or L2. It's where the combined gravitational pull of the sun and the earth causes the telescope to maintain this constant straight line configuration between the sun and the earth. And that is how it will remain uh, as it operates and views the universe on our behalf. So let us begin now by peering through the looking glass, climbing up to the watchtower and looking out into the universe. So this is the looking glass that we have on the James Webb Space Telescope. Its golden primary mirror is enormous, it's two and a half times that of the Hubble. So James Webb's very large mirror means that it will be able to detect very faint galaxies right at the very edge of the observable universe. But also this golden coating that is so iconic is what makes the telescope so sensitive to infrared light. And as we'll see, that's actually very important. And combined together, the large mirror and the sensitivity through the golden coating to the infrared means that the James Webb Space Telescope can see very distant galaxies. And so if we were to look through the telescope and peer out into the universe, this is one of the first images that the telescope has produced. It's still currently aligning each of its little mirror segments that form the 18 mirror full, uh, mirror segment full mirror. And this is one of the first spectacular images that the telescope has released. An image of a star in the center and you see the diffraction spikes heading out, making it look like a cosmic snowflake. But out in the distance, we see these interesting oval-like objects. These are the galaxies that fill our universe, the distant treasure islands that we'll be searching for in our quest for the first stars. So we'll not be looking for the treasure islands of old surrounded by the waters of our earthly seas. No, we'll be looking for these treasure islands of the cosmos surrounded by the great sea 
of space. Now, if we want to find these, these first stars, the very first jewels in the night sky, the greatest treasure of all, where must we look? Well, in order to address that, we first need to understand how we can see the past. So imagine if you were on one of these ships and you went on an amazing adventure and you wanted to let your friends and family back home know how things were. Well, you'd want to send a message back home. But if you were to do that, it would take quite some time to do because the message would have to traverse our earthly seas to make it all the way back to your home. And so it takes time for that message to travel. And if you were moored on a ship further away from home, well, if you sent a message back home from there, it would take even longer for that message to make its way all the way back home. So in other words, messages from distant ships would take longer to reach us. And so if you were even further away, that message would take even longer still to make its way back home. And it's very much the same when it comes to messages from these distant galaxies. So we're not looking at messages now, but we're looking at their light. And so if you think about the light that's coming from distant galaxies, well, again, it will take time for that light to reach us here on Earth. Light travels very, very fast, but the universe is so huge that not even light can instantly traverse it. It's why we speak of light years, because it takes a long time for light to scale the vast distances of the cosmos. And so it takes time for the light to travel from these galaxies through the universe towards us on a vantage point on Earth. If you take a more distant galaxy and you look at how its light travels, well, this will take even longer for it to reach us. And so the light from distant galaxies takes longer to reach us. And again, if you take a much, much further galaxy, again, it will take even longer for that light to reach us here on Earth. So that's the key point. Light does not travel instantly. It takes time for that light to traverse the distance to reach us. And the further the galaxies are, the longer it takes that light to travel. And so if we were to think of that message on the ship and we were to open it up, well, this is what you might see. It would be a note describing how things were during your travels back home and perhaps a photograph of a sketch of your adventures of the day. But one thing that's important to note is that if you were to read this message and look at the photograph, it's not reflecting how things are right now, it's reflecting how things were when the message was sent. And so in a way you have a way of viewing the past, seeing how this person felt and what they were up to many months ago, if that's how long it took for the message to reach you to cross the seas back home. And it's much the same with the light from these distant galaxies. By the time this light reaches us, many millions or even billions of years have passed. And we see these galaxies not as they are now, but rather how they were at the time when the light was emitted. And since that was millions or even billions of years ago, this means that we see how these galaxies were millions or billions of years ago in the past. And so if we put all this together, what does it mean? Well, if you're looking deeper out into the distance, if you're peering further through the cosmos, well, it takes longer for the light to travel to reach us. And so actually we're looking further back in time, the further we're looking out into the distance. And what's amazing about this is that me means that we can directly see the past. We have a time machine. And if we want to find the very first stars, well, these are around at the very start of our universe. So we'll have to look very, very far into the distance to go all the way back in time. So the place where the first stars will be, well, they will be in very distant galaxies. Now, in order to identify very distant galaxies, there's one thing of importance regarding our universe that's quite special. You see, if we look at the animation on the left, we think of our universe as a bubble, well, this bubble is inflating, it's growing, it's ever expanding and stretching. And so what that means for the light rays that are coming off of these distant galaxies with the light being emitted is also stretching itself as well. And so the light emitted from these distant galaxies, it stretches from the blue color into the longer red color. And so the longer the light travels, the more of a stretch that the light undergoes, the more it shifts from the blue to the red. And this is what we call redshift. It is the stretching of light 
from blue to red. So when it comes to understanding this redshift, let's put it in the context of the message from our ship. If we had a galaxy very close by, well, if you look at the color of the message and of the picture, everything would still be as it should be. The, the true original colors are as they are. But the more distant the galaxies are away from more us, the more the colors are stretched out towards the red. So going from blue to more green colors, if the galaxy is an intermediate distant, distance away from us. And if the galaxy is even further away, it's quite distant, it gets stretched out into the orange. And finally, if the galaxy is very, very far away from us, the light gets stretched out into the red. And so what this means is if we want to find distant galaxies, what we're really looking for are galaxies that appear very red on the sky, because it's precisely these ones that have had their light travel for a very long time for it to be stretched from the blue to the red to give that very red color. So if we look out into our universe and we look at very blue galaxies, these are going to be relatively nearby. And if we look at galaxies that appear more yellow on the sky, these are going to be an intermediate distance away. Galaxies that appear orange are quite distant from us. And galaxies that appear very red, like this one, are in fact very distant. And so the key point is, if we want to find very distant galaxies, well, we have to find galaxies that appear very red on the sky. And that's one of our cornerstones for finding these galaxies in our cosmic treasure hunt. But there's one other cornerstone that we have to bear in mind. Imagine you have your distant, far off island. It's mysterious, it's shrouded in a mist. Well, much the same is actually true for these galaxies. They're all surrounded by this mist as well. But rather than this being a hindrance, it's actually a great help for astronomers. And this is why. If you think of light, the light that we're familiar with, it's the visible, it's what we can see with our own eyes. It's the rainbow of color going from blue to red. But there's actually more to light than just that which our own eyes can see. You can go beyond the red into the so-called infrared, or you can go beyond the violet into the so-called ultraviolet. This is not light that we can see with our own eyes, but this is light that is out there in the universe and our telescopes can actually pick up. And something important regarding this mist that's surrounding all of these galaxies is, is this. So this mist is actually pretty much not affecting the visible lights or the infrared light at all. So if you were to shine this light through the mist, it passes through very easily. It's not at all affected. So the light from a, a galaxy would appear bright in the visible and would appear bright in the infrared. On the other hand, the light that's in the ultraviolet is very much absorbed. It's very much blocked by this mist surrounding these galaxies. Think of the sunscreen that you might be applying to protect your skin from the sunlight, from the ultraviolet light. You can think of the same kind of effect, the mist around these galaxies acting as a sort of sunscreen, blocking the light from passing through. And so, in other words, if we look in the visible and in the infrared, that's where we see the galaxies. And if we look into the ultraviolet, that's where we don't. So we can play this game, now you see me, now you don't. That is what we can do to find these galaxies. So imagine you have a galaxy like this and you want to see what it looks like out of a very particular color, or perhaps what it looks like in the red hues. Well, you'd want to use something like the stained glass, but not the stained glass that you might be familiar with, but really the astronomical equivalent, an astronomical filter in the red. If you were to place this red filter in front of your galaxy, you'd just be picking up all the red light. And so you'd be able to see the galaxy in that red filter. And if you were to place an orange filter, you'd also be able to see the galaxy in that filter because it's light in the orange colors is able to pass through that mist surrounding the galaxy. And the same is true in the green. But if you were to look in the ultraviolet, you wouldn't see anything at all because all that ultraviolet light is blocked. Now, important regarding this is that this is just applying for the true intrinsic light that's being given off by these galaxies, but we have to remember this redshift, the stretching of the light, the fact that distant galaxies are red, that the light that they've emitted has been stretched out. So for nearby galaxies, it's true that we'd see them in the red, orange, and green filters and not in the ultraviolet. But for a galaxy that's slightly further away at intermediate distance, well, 
its ultraviolet light that had been blocked is going to be stretched out towards the blue and green colors. And so we're going to have a lack of light, not only in the ultraviolet, but also a lack of light in the blue and the green. So now you won't see the galaxy at those colors. So if you play this game of now you see me, now you don't, you see the galaxy in the red and the orange, but you wouldn't see it in the green and the ultraviolet. If the galaxy was very distant from us even further away, well, its light would be redshifted, stretched out even more. And so now if you play this game, now you see me, now you don't, you'd only see the galaxy in the red and not in the other colors, the orange, the green, or the ultraviolet, because the light has been stretched out further. So the key point is that if we want to find distant galaxies, well, they appear red, but they also disappear in redder filters because of this mist that is surrounding them. And so now we know what to do, how we can use our treasure chart. Because imagine if you were creator of, a, of a, a treasure chart and you wanted to label where your treasure was hidden. Well, you wouldn't want everyone to know exactly where it is. You try to be a bit crafty. So you'd have to look at your treasure chart in the right light to be able to find out where it is. And so if you were to shine the light onto your treasure chart, then only you would know where the treasure was hidden. And it's much the same with galaxies. We have our cosmic treasure chart, our image of the heavens. And if we look at it in different colors of light, then that's how we can find where these distant galaxies, these distant treasure islands are located. We look at these galaxies in the green, in the yellow, and in the red. And combined together, we can find these distant treasure islands. If we look on the right, we see these three images of the same patch of sky, each in a different filter, a green filter at the top, a yellow filter in the middle, and a red filter at the bottom. And if we start from the bottom and move our way up, you'll see in, within the white circle, you see a, a patch of light, a galaxy present in the red filter. And you also see that same patch of light, the galaxy in the yellow filter, but it's missing in the green, it's disappeared. So if we think back to our game, now you see me, now you don't. We know why this is the case. It's that mist surrounding these galaxies that blocking out the light. And so by looking out into the universe with these different filters and these different colors, we can get the universe to reveal its, his, its hidden treasure islands to us. So that is our base way of finding very distant galaxies. But if you were searching for treasure, I don't think you'd be happy enough just knowing that a particular island might hold treasure. You'd want to know exactly where it is. You'd want to have some reassurance some confidence that the great adventure and great journey you're going to undertake in search of that treasure is worthwhile. So you'd want something like an X marks the spot to make sure that you're looking at the right thing. And so we have something very similar in astronomy, an X marks the spot. And that's what we're looking at here. It's actually glowing hydrogen gas that's been energized by very young hot blue stars in the center. And this glowing hydrogen gas is very bright. And as you can see from this picture, it shines with a very specific pinkish red color. And so these two points are key. The fact that the glowing hydrogen is so bright that it shines with a very specific pinkish red color, it means that this is actually our astronomical X marks a spot. And it's quite convenient because the X marks a spot is normally given by a red X and actually the hydrogen gas glows that very same red color. So if we think about our astronomical X marks spot, the, X, the, the glowing hydrogen gas, if we take the rainbow of light from a galaxy, we break it down into its spectrum, then what we can see is we can see how bright or how faint the galaxy shines at each color. And we can find the signature, the fingerprint of that glowing hydrogen gas. It really sticks out like this because it is so bright and it's at a very particular color, we can find it. And so this is for a galaxy that's very nearby, but if we remember very distant galaxies have their light stretched out. And so what we can do in that case is we can measure where we find this fingerprint of the glowing hydrogen in the rainbow of light, the spectrum for these distant galaxies. And we can compare that to the true pinkish red color that it should have. So we compare our infrared color that we'd get from the James Webb Space Telescope to the pinkish red color we have in the visible 
And we can use that to figure out how far away these galaxies are away from us. That's really our X marks the spot to really know for sure that these galaxies are very distant indeed. So now we know where our treasure islands are. Now all that we have to do is we have to dig for the treasure. And so the James Webb Space Telescope will be looking very, very deeply at these very distant treasure islands, these very distant galaxies, hoping to find that elusive treasure. And so to do that, it will be looking for many dozens to hundreds of hours for each galaxy on the sky, hoping to find that treasure. But how will we know that we found it? How will we know that we struck gold? Well, if you were digging for a treasure, you'd hear that characteristic thud. You'd feel it as the treasure chest stru is struck by your, your shovel as you're digging into the sand. And you'd take the treasure chest out and you look at all the fascinating jewels and gold inside. In terms of our quest, our search for the first jewels in the night sky, the very first stars in the universe, this is what we're going to be looking for. We're going to take the rainbow of light we had before. And as you can see, there's lots of lines that are jutting up on this, this diagram. These are very specific uh, fingerprints, chemical fingerprints within the rainbow of light. They're signatures of particular elements. So the strong line that I've labeled here is the one of hydrogen, but there's also ones for helium, for oxygen, for carbon, for nitrogen, for many of the chemical elements. And so what makes the very first star special is that they are in fact pure hydrogen and pure helium. This is because there was only hydrogen and helium in the universe at the very dawn of time. And so the first stars could only be made out of hydrogen and helium. What that means is that these first stars contain no other chemical elements. So no carbon, no oxygen, no iron or copper, not even gold or silver. So we're aiming to strike gold, but not literally because there's no gold within these first stars. So if we look at our chemical fingerprints and we find that there's only hydrogen, only helium and no other chemical elements, that's how we'll know that we're looking at one of these first stars. But it's not going to be quite that simple. For a treasure this elusive and this grand, you might think that there'll be lots of competition to deal with. We have to win the race, not against lots of other treasure seekers of the past or heading out in their boats. No, we have to win the race against time itself. Because unlike our sun, which lives for a very long time, has a lifetime of 10 billion years, so it's very slowly creeping along the plank to its end. The very first stars in the universe, they had a very short lifetime, only 5 million years. They're really rushing off, off this plank. And so if we want to find these stars, if we actually want to see them, we actually have to be very lucky because these first jewels, they fade away very quickly. But if we do manage to do it, if we do manage to succeed, well, then we will found the greatest treasure in all the cosmos, the very first jewels in the night sky. And these will be the very biggest, the brightest, and the most beautiful stars ever to shine in a universe because they provided the first light to shine through the darkness, to heat up the universe and provide it with the first chemical elements other than hydrogen and helium, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen. So precious and pristine, the first stars provided the heat, the light and the, and the nutrients to bring the universe to life. Without these first stars, we'd have no galaxies, we'd have no nebulae, no planets, We'd have no rivers, no mountains, no forests. Without these stars, we'd have none of the things we hold dear, none of the great treasures we each have. And if we find these stars through them, we'll be able to witness the universe awakening at the very dawn of time, seeing the universe emerge from its eternal slumber, just moments after the beginning of time, at the dawn of creation. So that is the great treasure that we seek, and that is the great treasure that we hope to find with the James Webb Space Telescope. But if we've learned anything from history is that there are many hidden treasures that might be out there waiting us that we don't even know about, that we've not even dreamed to think 
could be out there. And so that then begs the question, well, what will be the case, the James Webb? What hidden treasures will await us? Nature has the greatest creativity of all, and there may be many unexpected surprising, unexpected surprises waiting for us out in the cosmos. Only time will tell. But one thing is certain. If there is treasure out there hidden beneath the sands, the James Webb Space Telescope will be the one to find it. Thank you. Wonderful, James. Um, what, uh, absolutely wonderful stuff. It's so exciting to hear about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I cannot wait until the first science images arrive a bit later this year, and then the first science papers start trickling in soon after that. Um, it's a very, very exciting time for astronomy, and you described it beautifully. So thank you so much uh, for coming and giving a guest tour for us. Um, so I think the, the Cambridge Astronomical Association are, have eyes on the International Space Station, which I think is just starting um, its pass over Cambridge. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Paul and Brian of the CAA. Uh, how's it looking, guys? Okay. Right. If David can share, we'll see if we got it. Right. The the uh, space station just takes over uh, an hour and a half to go over. And in um, this is an all sky camera that David's got. And every 20 seconds, it updates the image. And you should see the space station as a streak going along past the sky. At the moment, it's coming towards the top of the, the, the zenith. And there's uh, usually about seven astronauts on board. But today, there's 10. Um, there's one German, two Russians, three Chinese and four Americans. And the German and a German and one of the Americans have just finished a spacewalk about half an hour ago. They were uh, replacing a radiator and doing other upgrades. Hey, hey Brian, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I can see it looking out of the observatory slit here. Yeah. It's uh, rising up and it's just about to pass beneath Aldebaran. All right, yes. Taurus. In fact, yeah. it's going to go right through the Hyades at any moment. So you should start to see it as long as you've got... Yeah. Coverage of Aldebaran. No. Yeah, we've got that. And what it will do, it will pass between um, Auriga and um, Gemini, which is the two bright uh, constellations towards the bottom um, left of centre. Should be coming on your screen any second now. It's just gone past Aldebaran and it's... Uh halfway up towards Auriga now. So maybe your camera has stalled. Because uh... it should be shown. Here, here it is. comes. Here it comes. And as I say, they, they just, um, the two of them just uh, closed the hatch half an hour ago after, after doing some repairs and upgrades to the space station. It's absolutely and, beautiful here. It's an yeah, orange we, colour. Yeah, we've got it now. We can see it going on. And each 20 seconds, you'll see the track up, up, uh, 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 saw a new image processed. And uh, in a, next Wednesday, three of the astronauts will be coming back to Earth. So the... Um, the space shuttle will return to its normal crew of seven. And as I say, it takes about an hour and a half to complete an orbit, but there's only certain times you can see it when the, the sun is shining on it. You won't be able to see it for its next pass in an hour and a half because it will be in the Earth's shadow. And what we'll do, we'll watch it go up as it uh, um, heads uh, towards the the east and it will enter the earth's shadow so you'll see the line will gradually will, will fade at one end i 
gone outside the observatory. It's still really bright, but it's beginning to sink down over yeah. towards the east now. Yeah. And I expect in another 20 seconds or more, it will, it will start to fade as it enters the Earth's shadow. But of course, in an hour and a half's time, the Earth's shadow will be much further over, covering covering all of its um, all of its track. So you won't see it in an hour and a half's time. Beginning to fade now in the yep. direction of Virgo, fading and yeah, we can start to see the tip of the uh, the very tip of the track is much fa fainter than the uh, bottom bit of the track. So it's started to fade, but I think it's going to go off off screen in 20 seconds, just as it fades. But never mind, we've seen it. And if you if you look on the site called Heavens Above, you can um, put in ISS or International Space Station. It will show you the track of where it is. Okay, David, do you want to show your first object, please? Yes. You bring that here. And, oh, I can't see the control bar. Right. David's be going to gonna find some galaxies. I've got it. I've got in it. in Leo, in the Could constellation of Leo. Bring you here and share this one. Brilliant. Now we get three for the price of one. Well, I can see two. And there's the third. Right. This uh, this group of galaxies is at a distance of over. Th oh, there's a some satellite tracks. Is that there's some lines on our? Yeah, we we've get got lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are much smaller because the space station is just so bright. It's um, brighter than Venus, but that's that's a nice picture now. And this group of galaxies at a distance of over thirty light years. And it's known as the Leo triplet. There's three spiral galaxies, all about the same size as the Milky Way. The top one is, a, is called the Hamburger Galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy seen edge on. We're looking uh, directly at the spiral arms. And you can see the dust band uh, of, of the uh, spiral arms go, going across the Hamburger galaxy. And it's a, it's a bit warped. It's not as straight as it should be. Uh, it's been pulled about by uh, interaction with another galaxy. Now, if we go to the bottom left galaxy, this is M66. You can see it's a little more face on. Are you whizzing up to it? Put it that, down. That, that's M Here we are. You've got both M66 on the left and M65 on the right. And M66 is a little more face on. So you can see the spiral arms, but it's only got two spiral arms. One of them is very well formed, the, the, the left-hand side one. But the right-hand side spiral arm is very messy and very indistinct. And this wonky spiral arm was formed when the galaxy encountered another galaxy, most probably the Hamburger galaxy. What happened, it was thought that the, uh, the, this galaxy rolled round the edge of the Hamburger galaxy. So one spiral arm was totally disrupted. Uh, and even the nucleus of the galaxy was pulled out of its out of the center position. So it was pretty brutal encounter. Gravity has a lot to answer for. And th this galaxy has plenty of star formation going on because of all this disruption. Um, 
there's been five supernovae uh, happen here in the last 50 years. Normally, you'd only see one supernovae in 50 years in a galaxy like this. So there's a lot of disturbance and gas and dust is being disrupted and uh, star formation is taking place. So the, 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 the whole thing has uh, uh, suffered terribly with this encounter with the uh, Hamburger galaxy. The other galaxy on the right, the M65, again, also seen obliquely, and we can see a bit of the dust lane uh, from the gas and dust in the spiral arms. But this, they're very different to M66. There's hardly any star formation going on. And it, it's the boring one of the three. Uh, and it, it, there's a, it doesn't seem to have interacted with either of the other two galaxies, despite it being just a few diameter, galaxy diameters away. Good. Okie doke. We're ready for Paul now. Right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Uh, David um, needs to stop sharing. That's it. Yeah. And we should have our familiar object, the Iran Nebula. We'll get one last. Yeah, I had it just now. I just got to uh, change the. I had to change the camera battery while you were talking. Oh right. So <laughs> no, no, no. Don't ten worry. Ten seconds time. But fortunately, you've got uh, what you got on your screen. I've got a convenient <laughs> backdrop there, but that's cheating. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one I prepared earlier. Here, com yeah. here comes the camera. Right. Can you see see that yes. now? Yes, we can see the the trapezium. These are the. Um, four stars that can be seen with the binoc even with binoculars when you uh, zoom in to uh, the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is part of the sword of Orion, which hangs down from the three stars that make up the hunter's belt. And uh, Galileo, when he turned his telescope to, to this in February 1617, only saw three of the four stars because his, the optics on his, these early telescopes were not very good. Uh, but we now know that I, if you increase the sensitivity, we should see things start to develop. Yeah, I'm just having an issue that this control bar is over the top of the other one that I want to use. <laughs> and I can't get, get it to move. Right. Right. We, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot now, just a short one. See if that'll come up. Okay. So that that's slightly increased the exposure time. Now, now we can see the four stars very clearly, and you can see one of them is the the two um, right hand ones are very close together, and poor old Galileo couldn't couldn't split those two. But we're starting to see uh, some nebulosity now. The, the familiar pinkish colour. Yeah. And as you increase it, we'll I'll go see. Go for more. another one. Yeah, go for it. So that was a one second exposure. Yeah. And you get a bit more. That's it. It's come, starting to come now. And this uh, pinkish colour is from glowing hydrogen gas, which is being excited by radiation from newborn stars. And while the, 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 yeah, the pinkish areas are uh, glowing, emitting light by their own, as Paul increases the exposure, exposure, you might see some blue areas. And these are reflected light from uh, blue stars, hot young blue stars. But mostly, it's the predominantly the uh, pinky colour we'll see. So that's four seconds exposure. The, the, just to let people know, I've got a quite a large 14-inch mirror-based telescope with my ordinary Canon DSLR camera 
on the back um, and are just using the Canon remote control software here. So I clicked and we're counting away here. You can see the number ticking up. I'm going to go for 16 seconds this time. So we'll see a, a lot more. And what it is, is we're, there's a whole gas cloud behind the constellation of Orion. And we're like looking into a bite of an apple. The central bit is a cavity. And this cavity has been blown out by uh, the pressure from these hot young stars. And this cavity is about... Um, 24 light years across, whereas the whole nebula is about 40 light years across. But we've got this a hollow that we're looking into. And when the Hubble Space Telescope looks into this uh, ho hollow, it can see young stars that still have uh, nebulae round them, sort of um, proto stars they are. They've got clouds of dust and a torus of dust around them and the stars are just switching on so if we look here back here in in hundreds of thousands of years time there'll be a, a bright cluster of about three thousand stars there right but that's go, it go, going for the 30 seconds and just right I think that'll be the limit then, Brian, because I can already see the Start background is starting yeah. to brighten, which is yeah. a clue that we're on Coming. the limit. So here it comes, 29, 30, 31, 32. And I bet the 16 second image is better. Yes. Yeah. Don't worry. That's, uh, but that's, that you can see it with the binoculars, but of course your eyes aren't sensitive to red. So you'll only see it as a, f a faint misty patch with the trapezium in. But oh, what's happened? You've lost it. I, I got rid of it. The, uh, Are you going back to the 16 second? There's the trapezium in detail. All right. I was just going to finish with M43, but if you've... Okay, you can have that. Uh, I'll go back. This toolbar is really irritating. <laughs> I can't control what I want to. I'll, get, I'll do another 16 second shot. Here we go. Okay, do can talk about M43. Okay, do um, that's, that's yeah. If I, if I wanted to, to uh, make my images better, what I would do is take a series of 16 second exposures and then use the computer to uh, stack them all together and add yeah. them up, basically. So here it comes. There you are. That's brilliant. Now, if you could point to M43. Um, and this is just lit up by one star. It's another emission nebula. That means it's glowing from the uh, this bright star. Uh, and it's only quite small compared to its famous neighbour. It's just a couple of light years across. But a recent scientific paper looked at the carbon monoxide in both M42 and M43 and found by observing the spectra, um, the red shifts like that uh, James talked about, they could work out the motions of the gas clouds by using computer modeling. And it turns out that about three million years ago, M43, the small one, started bashing into the Orion Nebula. And this collision compressed the gas and dust and triggered the star formation uh, of the Orion Nebula and its cluster. So with uh, so the M42, the Orion Nebula, is a result of some careless driving by M43. So that's where we'll finish. And then we'll pass over to Jonathan. Is Jonathan with us? Strange silence. No. Okay. I, we'll can't, whiz I can't see Jonathan. David, no. have you got anything? Yes, I have. Right. We'll go up, go on to that back to David. Looks so Jonathan's had a crisis. Now 
we've got two objects for the price of one. And uh, the top one is another galaxy. And the left, uh, the, the bottom one is a planetary nebulae. And uh, if I can just... Um, you see that? The, yeah, we can see the planetary nebulae is just a few thousand light years away. It's in our own Milky Way, whereas we're looking through the Milky Way to that distant galaxy beyond. And that's over 40 million light years away. And these two can be found just below the square bit of the, the familiar star group called the Plough. And, uh, but unfortunately, they're out of the range of binoculars. Now, um, David zoomed in on the Owl Nebula. You can see it's got two, two eyes. The star, it's a star about twice as massive as our sun that's come to the end of its nuclear fuel and thrown off its, the outer layers of the star. And all that is left is a white dwarf, which you can see, that's it, right at the center. And this white dwarf is 20 times hotter than our sun and will spend the rest of eternity just slowly cooling down. But the material from the uh, expelled from the dying star was came in two directions, one towards us and one away from us. And they're two cone shaped bits of gas uh, and they're nearly perfectly aligned, but not exactly. So one cone of light is offset to one side and the other that's going away from us. And the other cone of light that's coming towards us is set offset the other side, making these two eyes. Um, if we can go over to the galaxy now. Can you zoom up to the galaxy, please? Yeah. Come on. Come on. That's it. You can Come along. I've got lots of satellites. Yeah, satellites these are increasingly uh, problematic. For Here images. we go. This is uh, M108. The M numbers I talk about uh, are just uh, named after Messier, a French uh, comet hunter that wanted to see comets, but these fuzzy objects kept getting in his way. So he made a list of things not to look at and mistake for comets. Uh, so the, as well as being called M108, it's also called the surf ballot surfboard galaxy another spiral galaxy seen obliquely but you, we we can't see its spiral arms very well it, it, even face on this the spiral arms would be very ill-defined and very dusty it did, doesn't even have a pro prominent nucleus the whole galaxy is very messy and unkempt clearly it's having a bad hair day Okay, Paul, have you, are you ready for the next one? Have we, oh, Paul's on mute. Paul, you're on mute. Paul, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, That's can okay. you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just... Um getting an image of M78 on the screen for you in oh. Orion. All oh, right. I, I think you asked me for last week when I wasn't here. Okay, yeah. Okay, we can, we can so, um, look at that. It's right on the limit of my capabilities, I think. Let's see if I've got anything. Oh, it's very faint. Just a smudge. Yeah, it is very faint. Yeah. This one, this one is um, not an emission nebula, but it's a, a reflection nebula. The gas isn't being excited. It's just reflecting the blue color from hot young stars. But we'll see if we can see it. See oh. if we can get a bluish tinge. If not, we'll just 
just have to switch on our imagination. Yeah, it's here. Look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's well, there's a little bit of high cloud, isn't there? So you, there is it, now, and, and, and you're uh, you're looking bleakly through a lot of sky because um, Orion is predominantly a, a winter constellation. And as we're coming to the end of the winter, it's very low down in the sky, and so looking bleakly through a lot of atmosphere. Uh, it does does present problems. Let's uh, just give it a very long exposure and see what happens. And we can what we on your background. We can see some of the blue color from re reflected light. We can see the pink color from uh, <laughs> in Orion. We can see the pink from the glowing gas, and yeah. but the blue color. And especially on M43, we can see the blue colour, and that's reflected light. So they're the two types of nebulae, emission nebulae and reflection nebulae. So an M78 through the Merck is a reflection nebulae. Again, it's the bright stars you can see that are lighting up the gas, but it's not, not exciting the gas. I think the problem also is when it gets a little bit murky like this, my auto tracking that locks onto stars and follows them across the screen um, as the Earth turns starts to fail. So they start trailing. So let's see what this image is probably yeah. uh, the best we could possibly do. Yeah. Oh, well, the yep. stars are round. That's good. And you can yeah. see the blue nebula there. Yeah. Yeah. We can just. Or rather, but... a, rather a blue background. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, but, uh... We Push don't the mind. boat out there for yeah. you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll just use our imagination. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, we're coming to the end of the t our time. Um, you haven't got anything else, have you, David? Um, I'm wondering what's nearby that I could go to. Uh, don't, don't worry. If it's, if it's, and not move the dome. Yeah. Um, no, we, we'll, we'll call it, call it a day. Um, we've had a, we've had our a half hour so thanks very much to Paul and David and we'll hand back to Matt wonderful and there we go well thank you so much observers for that um, wonderful tour around the night sky and it's so lovely to see the International Space Station what a wonderful way to finish our 2022 season a fantastic talk about James Webb which is the future of so much astronomy mm -hmm. and uh, a view of the night sky and the International Space Station. So that's it for our 2021-2022 season. We'll be back, of course, in the autumn, in October, and I'm crossing my fingers very hard. Um, I think uh, unless something catastrophic happens, uh, we'll be in person in October in uh, the Institute of Astronomy, be able to do uh, talks and stargazing face to face. And I can't wait to have a wonderful summer, everyone, and see you in October. There we go.